let's get started. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our presenter today. Tom Shin is class of 97 and 2002. Um, is that right, Tom? Is it 04? Anyway, I don't Tom, remember. It was so long ago. <laughs> Tom's all of a sudden, I'm starting to doubt that. Tom's been um, in the HR recruitment field for almost 20 years. He is director of talent acquisition and workforce services for a lot workforce solutions a leading recruiting firm in the Capital District. He oh also is, ah, nice, little purple and gold swag to start us off. He's also the owner of Build Better Culture, which provides services around workplace culture, employee engagement, and leadership development. So I'm really excited to have you here, Tom, to, to hear what you've got to say and share with us about how we can improve our own corporate culture. So I'll turn it over and um, I'll see you a bit later. Fantastic. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, let me get my share screen up here and uh, we'll get rocking and rolling here. So yeah, my my UAlbany experience was uh, a long time ago and I, I won't say the rest of that line because I'll get ostracized by my friends Amanda and maybe Andrea who I saw were in the in the participant list. Um, but uh, we are here to talk about um, influence your, influencing your company culture, whether it's from an employee side, a manager side, uh, owner of a business. There's lots of different angles that you can come at this with, but the ability to have an impact on your culture is really at everyone's uh, arm's reach, if you will, meaning you don't have to be the owner of the company to help improve a workplace culture. You can be a frontline employee, you can be a manager, you can be an HR. There's a number of different spaces that you can play with. So we're gonna talk about what culture is. We're gonna talk about employee engagement. Uh, we're gonna talk about why they matter, uh, some good examples of great culture and engagement. Um, I invite some participation. So if you have some examples of things, throw it into the chat, throw it in uh, to the Q&A section. Um, as Melissa had given you instructions that um, I didn't listen to word for word, but um, I know the rest of you were. So uh, we'll go through that. And there's some questions that I'll throw at you as well. So feel free to jump on those and participate. Whose responsibility? It really is everyone. Does it come from the top down? Absolutely. Uh, you have to have the reinforcement of the top line leadership in your organization to really foster and grow that company culture and that employee engagement. But it doesn't mean that's the only person who's responsible for that. Everyone is. And we'll talk a little bit about what you can do, regardless of your role. You know, if you're just coming into the workforce and you're new, you may be thinking, I can't change that. I, I would challenge that. There may be certain things that you're limited to, but um, everyone has an opportunity to contribute and um, be a part of the solution to things, at least in my viewpoint. It's something. So, um, so what employees, I thought we'd talk a little bit about here, what employees are expecting from employers these days. They want fair pay, obviously Pay Transparency Act. For those of you not in HR, there's a Pay Transparency Act here in New York State that went into effect on the 17th. So people want to be paid fairly. Yeah, everybody wants to make a million dollars. Who doesn't? But at the end of the day, you want to be paid fairly for the work that you're providing. You know, is somebody going to pay you more for that? Is somebody going to pay you less? Those are all good questions, but as long as you're paid fairly, folks aren't necessarily going to be jumping ship unless there's some phenomenal gap where somebody's going to double their income to do something similar. People want flexibility. They want the ability to have the option to potentially work from home once in a while, to be able to get the kids on the bus or off the bus to help mom and dad with things because they're in that retiree mode um, or just need some extra assistance running to doctor's appointments. At some point, our parents can't drive for themselves, so some of us got to help them out. They want some autonomy. People want uh, some challenging work. They want to be given the opportunity to learn and develop either in a progression of roles, meaning promotability, or gaining new skills. You know, that's common in the software industry, gaining more and more skills to program this and develop that and have some creative impact on those things. And of course, the biggest thing is they want a great culture. And we can spat stats. I have some stats later on, but really uh, trust me when I say that people, this is the number one thing people leave for. We say bad managers, it's a close second now, 
great culture, a good culture is really critical to, to keeping your employees. Now, when employers are expecting in employees, hardworking, reliable, low turnover, meaning loyalty into the organization, discretionary effort. So, you know, there's that thought process of, you know, the employer wants somebody to work 45, 50 hours a week, stay a little late once in a while, which is really, you know, a couple times a week when the workload is there. Um, some roles dictate it more than others. Um, employers expect people who want to be there. They expect you to know all this and that and the other about your organization when they're even interviewing or applying. Um, they want people who want to be there and want to be part of your organization. And they want people aligned with satisfying their customer needs. And again, they want good company culture. Most business owners and leaders in this, in, in any industry, realize that retention is tied to having good culture and having a good fabric. It's just a matter of do they realize what they have? Or are they making assumptions about it? So what is culture? I've used this, uh, my friend Brian and I use this slide every so often. Um, the healthy culture is the bridge. You see the concentric circles here between who we think we are, what we are in practice, and what our values say. So you can have the greatest people in the world who are doing the best things, but if your values aren't aligned, you're gonna be missing out on some things. And so as with any concentric circle, example, you miss one of the components, you're going to miss out on a huge chunk of opportunity. But your culture is how you tie to uh, your employees, how they connect with that mission and vision of what your organization is about. Why is it so important? Well, when you're in alignment with what your people need, you're going to have increased employee engagement and retention. And what I mean by that is that people who feel cared about, who feel listened to, who feel part to be, they're part of the solution, part of the progress moving forward in your organization. And I can see that and feel that both from an organizational standpoint, but even with their teammates and their managers, right? That's an engaged employee. And we're gonna talk a little bit more. I have some more examples about that, but it's so important because if you don't have that, you're risking people bolting. You're risking people underperforming. You're risking the toxic Avenger syndrome, meaning you've got somebody who's just ornery and rah, 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 and you know exactly who I'm talking about. You've seen it in classes. If you're a student, you've seen it in the workplace where you just have someone who's angry at life. And regardless of the reason, that's infectious, right? And if you don't nip that in the bud with a good base of company culture, you're in trouble. So culture overall, it's what we see. This you're going to see a hum, if you will, proverbial hum to your organization and how it runs, whether it's virtual, in-person, or mix. There's a collective moving forward, and I don't want to say overly effusive positiveness, but people are generally intent and uh, openly productive and, and happy about what they're doing, right? So you can see that hum. It's not everything, but you're going to see folks you know when folks are unhappy, you can kind of see it's like the the stillness when you walk into the room. Um, that that you can definitely see when it's the other side. It's definitely what we say. I was watching a rerun of some show and they had some uh, president and he was yelling f bombs and all sorts of curses and this and that and the other. And I'm not saying you can't curse in the workplace. That's you know we're not at that place. But if you're starting to curse at people and around them so much, it becomes hostile, right? That's the bad side. You know, when you have yellers and screamers, I'm not a fan of that. I get emotional as much as anybody else. But the yelling and screaming is, it's just, it's a no-go. It's a deal breaker. If you find yourself in that environment and that person's not willing to change, then it's time to start looking. And your employees are going to see that too, right? But it's also the good that you do. The good things that you say, the reinforced attitudes, the positive reinforcement that you're giving. Hey, great job. Thanks for coming in today. I appreciate you coming in. You can't just say, I pay you, so you need to come to work. That's not good leadership. That's giving marching orders and almost a dictatorship, right? So what we say does matter. How you say it does matter, right? Both within teams, whether you're an official leader capacity or you're a colleague, right? And you're more of a, an unspoken leader, if you will. You don't have that title, but you bear that essence of stepping forward, volunteering for things and taking uh, point on different activities. And it's also what we do, right? The actions always speak louder than words. 
if you act like a jerk, you're, you know, you're going to get called out on it. You know, we all make mistakes, own them. You know, that's how we learn. That's how people develop. That's how we move forward and in, in progressing in different things. Um, but, you know, by all means, what you do matters, what your leaders do matter. And sometimes they don't realize that they are on stage. Every single one of your frontline leaders, every one of your supervisors, they're on stage the moment they walk into the door. It, you know, it's sort of a, in the line of, well, I earned this position and there's a little bit of entitlement. It's kind of funny now because we talk about how the younger generations appear to be entitled about what they're asking for and what they're trying to do in today's workforce. When in the same token, some folks are in the same bucket. They're they're in that entitlement mode and, and about how they expect things to do. The world is changing, right? So if we're not changing with it, who's going to get left behind? Right. That's the only constant in today's world is change. We are always going to change and evolve. That's science, that's math, that's society, um, everything changes. And that's not a bad thing. A lot of folks are afraid of it. That's one of the biggest fears that people have is change from the norm. So what is employee engagement? Gallup, Quantum Workplace, they're two bigger sources of information when it comes to uh, workplace data and information and surveys that they run out. But Gallup, it's, it's engaged employees are... Those who are involved in, enthusiastic about, and committed to their work and workplace. You have a challenge come up, somebody steps up. And they'll say, yeah, let me let me work with Joe on this, or let me work with Susie or Bob on this. Quantum Workplace puts it as the strength of the mental and emotional connections employee feel toward their places of work, right? Are you as excited about going to work? And do you talk in the same manner at home about work as you do at work? If they're conflicting, there's an issue. And leadership has an impact on that. How you manage and lead people has an impact on how people feel about your employment or your place of work. So here's your stats slide. Um, it all points to um, when you have uh, different sets of outcome. When people are engaged, they're more productive. When people are disengaged, it goes completely the other direction and it will drag people along with them. Um, you know, and you'll have, you know, retail, you might have some theft, people just don't care. Um, but, you know, great organizations are going to have a thriving environment, they're going to be more profitable. Everyone's going to be more excited about going with the flow and helping be part of that success. When times do get rough with some organizations, everybody goes through upturns and downturns. Um, and, you know, having that highly engaged workforce will help you stem that tide. So here's your disengaged. Uh, <laughs> for those of you that are more recently out of school, you can recognize this, right? That this is the employee who just does just the least amount. If you've worked in some environments where that person just doesn't seem to care, right? They don't, they're just doing the very least possible not to get fired, right? They show up, you know, more often than not on time, but sometimes late, but just enough that it's like, eh. I could be here, I could not, I could get another job, I really don't care, this is a paycheck to me. They're not about the mission. There's nothing connecting them to what you're doing. They'd be happy with the C minus grade because it's passing, not because they put in the effort, not because they worked all weekend to get to a certain point. You know, and I'll point at procrastination, but I'm a procrastinator. So I, you know, I, I will I will say that sometimes it's just lighting a fire into somebody gets them moving. Um, but this is, you know, physically present but in a manner of speaking, they're not, they're checked out. And that's, you know, that's a tough battle to place. So, you know, you can throw some of these into, uh, I see there's a little chat bubble here. You know, why are people staying with your organization, right? Um, why do people stay there? Your colleagues, your employees, why are your customers coming back to you, right? And if you have some thoughts, you know, if you want to chime in about why people stay in your organization, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, I'm happy to kind of see what responses you all might have to why people are staying in your organization. Or if you're in that role where you're the participant or the employee versus, you know, management, so to speak, throw that in there. Why are you staying with your organization? Or why do you see your colleagues stay? Or why do they tout that? Right. Those are moments for celebration. I have some things here. I'm just going to pull this up. Right. Great colleagues company potential, supporting the mission, feeling like you belong, challenging work, flexibility. These are all perfect examples of why people stay. 
if you're not providing that for your people or your teammates and giving that feedback to your management, you're not doing everything that you can. I'm a huge proponent of owning personal accountability. And there are elements to that, which mean that have I done everything that I can? Have I impacted? Have I asked the right questions of myself? Not Jane, Sue, Bobby, Frank, and Joe, right? I'm asking, what have I done? Did I ask the right question? Did I go to the right person? Did I put my extra uh, discretionary effort out there? So there's lots of examples that you can play with on that front. Um, and by all means, drop your questions in here. Benefits, yeah, thanks, Brett. So Brett, Brett will appreciate. Brett's a classmate of mine. So thanks for joining us, Brett. Uh, we were we were at the uh, alumni quad together way back in the day. So here's what engagement is. You know, engagement is not what we assume. So if you're in one of those organizations where you're making assumptions, we all can read the letters. You know what happens when uh, you make assumptions, right? Um, a lot of times I'll run into business owners. They're smaller business, mid-sized businesses where they have opinions. They only see part of what's going on. And so they form their opinions based around what they observe. They're not asking questions. They're making guesses or they're hearing rumors about this and that and the other. There's hearsay or my other, one of my favorite, my uncle's brother's cousin's dog's best friend's owner said, right? That long list of connection. It's kind of like the country song, you know, the dog, the truck, the, the spouse, et cetera. If you're relying upon instinct versus asking direct questions, you're missing an opportunity to find out what's really going on. I'm a huge proponent of an engagement survey. Do you need to do the monthly? Absolutely not. That'll probably go the opposite direction. Twice a year, once a year, check in, do a pulse survey, ask a couple of questions. It doesn't, surveys don't need to be 7,000 questions. If you're after a couple of little elements to determine, are your people engaged? I can help you with kind of what questions to ask. You can Google what questions to ask, but it doesn't need to be this huge laundry list of things, right? But don't make assumptions about it. It's going to burn you in the end. You may get it right a little bit once in a while, but I, I promise you at the end of the day, those assumptions are going to make a you-know-what out of yourself. So question time. What's worse, having a disengaged employee or have employees lose your organ leave your organization, right? If you had your choice, which would you rather really have? You know, it's it's a toss up, right? Because you can't put the widgets through the system without the right number of hands moving the widgets through the system. Um, but that said, having a disengaged employee can really drastically impact everyone else's part. Nobody wants to work with Susie. She's a sour grape. She's always in a bad attitude, right? Always talking smack about people, always worried about when, you know, why doesn't this person get, to, why don't I get to do this? Because this person does all the time. Well, when everybody's comparing with themselves, that's not that good fabric, right? You gotta you gotta nail those things out. And I'm just gonna keep popping in the Q and A here. Uh, should we send out a survey and ask employees what they like about? Absolutely, you should ask those questions, right? And so I'm I'm gonna interrupt on Elisa's uh, question here. Letting folks know that you want to do a survey and telling them what you're gonna do with that information go hand in hand, right? I can't make a symbol for hand in hand, but they go hand in hand. Can't just ask a survey and sit on the information. People know that that question's out there. As I promise you, if one person has that question, somebody else has that question too. But if you're going to ask, hey, let me throw three or four questions at you. You can keep it anonymous because they want to be anonymous or throw the old um, box with the paper slips and they can write it in an, in an anonymous suggestion box fashion. But when you have folks that are trying to communicate things to you, give them a vehicle to share that information. And when you're saying, hey, what brings you to work every day? That matters. What keeps you coming to work? What would make you go away from work? That takes time to develop those answers. But over time, you can do these little pulse surveys and ask them, even if it's in a one-on-one -on -one situation, that can be really helpful insight. And I'm just going to keep popping in here. That's an impossible question. <laughs> Thanks, Olivia. I appreciate that. Yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, I think at the end of the day, if you're honest about who we are, we're all human beings. Sometimes we have the answers to things. Sometimes we don't. And that's okay. Right? I'm going to close that box. And we'll keep moving through. So how culture and engagement connect? Well, yeah, I moved too fast. Well, I guess that slide just doesn't want to cooperate. All right, so we'll keep moving on. So true or false, 
people are engaged, that they show up every day, are always on time, have friends at work, talk to each other, don't complain, no wrong or right answer here. I just want your opinions. And you can just drop that right in the chat. True, false, true, false. False. Nina says false. Yeah, Elise says the same thing. Good indicators, for sure. Okay, and we'll tackle the Q&A at the end. Um, I, I don't mind doing them as we go. So this is, a, you know, in my opinion, this is a falsehood, right? Just because someone's showing up every day, well, there's motivation to show up every day because if I don't, I'm not gonna get a paycheck. Can't pay my mortgage, can't pay my car payment, can't pay buy food, um, clothes, all that stuff. We're always on time. Well, some people have a good work ethic. They're just not engaged. Two are not the same thing. Just because I'm always on time, that's my personal integrity showing up for on time doesn't necessarily have to do with being engaged at work, having friends at work. Well, hopefully people have friends, right? That That's kind of the, we're all human social beings. And um, if they don't, maybe we can help form some newer ones, but that's also not necessarily tied to engagement. Talk with each other. Well, what else are you going to do all day? Um, and don't complain. Some people are quiet. They don't jump into things. They don't uh, volunteer information. And some of the quietest folks, there's an introvert, extrovert kind of conversation piece to consider. But other folks, they're just biding their time, waiting for the next thing to materialize. So uh, I would say overall, probably false. There's good signs that you have some folks who are paying attention and motivated on their own end to be at work. But now what do you do with them? I clicked into something. All right, factors which cause disengagement. Um, poor management, number one or two reason people leave companies. Right. We talked about poor managers and bad culture absolutely cause disengagement. When you have somebody who's a yeller and a screamer or doesn't ask, how can I help you instead of why did you do that? Right. There's the attitudinal kind of perspective. They don't see the value in the work that they're doing. So no one's connecting with them. What you're doing, answering phone calls for these folks coming in, whether it's for health insurance or servicing widgets, et cetera. If they don't understand the value that they provide so that your company can be successful, your organization can be successful, they're not going to be as engaged. They're going to just think they're a number versus a person. If you can connect the two and help them understand, your leaders help them understand the value that they bring. By answering these phone calls, you're keeping our customers loyal and happy. You're helping them understand we're there to answer questions. Whether we have the right answer or not, we're trying to help them. And again, from a retail perspective, when you're buying things, you're going to go back to the folks that are helpful for you. Right. They may not have the product every time. They may not have the solution every time. But if they're honest with you and they have a good relationship with you, they're going to keep coming back. Lack of professional growth. All right. Smaller companies are probably going to struggle with this a little bit more so than the larger ones. But if somebody wants to aspire to do more, learn more, grow more, and they don't have that opportunity, and definitely if they see others doing it in other departments, it's going to grind on them. People generally want to learn. They want to acquire new knowledge. They want to get better at things. They want to contribute. And this is, you know, a huge factor which causes disengagement. Lack of reward and recognition. If I'm not telling somebody they're doing a good job, that's on me, right? Hidden factors of disengagement, burnout, home life factors. So these are things that seem relatively um, straightforward, People have lives. There's stuff going on in people's lives. And while managers are hesitant to ask some questions here and there to get too personal with folks, seeing how they're doing, seeing how somebody's grandparents doing, seeing how their kids are handling school and that they're back in session, how they're adjusting to the schedule of getting them on the bus and off the bus, dealing with school lunches and the lunch lines. And, you know, the, as we used to say, the cafeteria lady's always grouchy. All right. Well, if you smile at them, you know, they're probably going to be a little bit more apt to have some conversation, mental health and anxiety about any number of things, right? These are hidden factors that you may not necessarily see, even when you're asking the questions, but the fact that you're asking the questions demonstrates a level of care. Anonymous. All right. There's one person in our office who's really toxic, and I feel like he's really ruined the office environment for everyone. What can I do to address this and get back to where we used to be? Okay. Well, there's a conversation there. Right. And that that's going to take some planning and you might want to enlist some extra advice to go through that question. Um, so you phrase it right, because the, the last thing you want to do is attack somebody and saying, hey, Joe, you act like a jerk all the time. That's that's really not the intent. But hey, you seem to be off. Right. I want to see how I can connect with you and and what would it look like 
if you were happier at work or if I if you had more support at work? What are the issues that you're running into? And trying to get this done. Because at some point, that person was excited about coming to that company. What was it then that made them excited? And how do you recapture some of that? Right. And asking them what that path, what the end result path looks like, you know, how, what would it look like if you got back to that moment of, you know, being really engaged and happy about where you're coming to work? Now you have a starting and an end point. It's figuring out the roadmap and helping them be part of that solution. So I, I hope that helps you uh, with some of that. And that, that it's a longer game, but I would encourage you to get some help with some phrasing on there to have a conversation with that person. Whoever got the best relationship would be an ideal person. Um, right. And that's, that comes down to this showing they care. They may just feel like no one cares about them. And this can happen too. Sometimes you, you know, somebody applies for promotional opportunities in your roles and they get turned down and no one's telling them why, oh, someone was more qualified. That doesn't help. They, you know, they kind of understand where their qualifications sit and they're going to be comparing this. Well, I'm better than them, or I'm smarter than them, or I work harder than them. I start earlier, I leave later. Help them with more tactile elements about how they can do better. I need you to show me how you project manage things better. Hold people accountable better. Give me more examples of when you inspired people to do more. Any of those examples. Give them tactile, tactile things that they can work on improving and give them opportunities to do it. Because if you're saying you have to do X and Y and Z, but they don't have the opportunity to do it, where's the motivation, right? They know that. That's probably one of their qualms, right? Give them an opportunity. Pilot some mentoring, even if it's, you know, a couple times a month, a couple times a quarter. Give them opportunities to participate in some committees or other discussions where they can actually practice some of those skills. All right. So what's going to happen if you don't, right? How many of you receive these? This is a real in-mail that I received not too long ago, and I get these from time to time. You know, somebody's trying to pitch me to leave my organization. I, you know, I'm not going anywhere. But if you're not paying attention to your folks, somebody else is. And then when they get this in mail, they're going to respond. And hopefully, for your sake, it's not your top performer who got wooed away because someone's given them love, right? How many of these in mails will it take for that person to take action? They're going to know that they're in demand. All right. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? I put the scale there. I couldn't find another pound example for an art piece. <laughs> so let's talk about some examples of companies that are getting things right, right? Um, you know, it's it's a big piece to me to talk about stories because I think stories provide context that people can relate to. If you can relate to something, you can repeat it or you can model after it. So here's a company. This is a company in, in my area. I'm in, I'm still in the UAlbany network. I'm 20 minutes north of campus. I drive by it every so often, admire how large it's grown and how many things are going on there. Um, but this is a, a lighting company. So if you've ever been by a car wash, right, they've got all the lighting on the inside and how do they manage to not have lights corroding and rusting out with all that moisture inside? Companies like G&G &G are out there. So some of the stuff that they do, they have peer nominations for the employee of the month. So they put a little QR code up on the wall. Anybody with a smartphone that wants to submit, hey, I saw Bobby doing something great, clicks the QR code with their phone, types in what they want, and they do it peer to peer. It's not necessarily a manager saying, you're the best employee since sliced bread because you, you got us under budget on this one project. Whoops, moved too fast. I was going to click the chat here. Um, perfect. And Melissa put a note in there in the comments too. Um, there's monthly trophy celebrations. So same company, they bought basically a dollar store trophy, hot glued a couple of pieces to it, like a race car and some other thick pieces. Now it's a trophy that moves around from employee to employee each month. Again, based on the nominations, everybody reviews it. Um, and somebody's selected as a winner. Uh, they do QR codes or they do some manufacturing work. So there's safety. And, and if you're in a manufacturing space or you've been around one of them, one of the key elements that they have are near misses, right? And whenever there's an opportunity to catch something in a process that might have pinched a finger or saved a toe or um, any of those elements on the safety perspective, um, companies like this will have ways that people can communicate, hey, I think we should change this process because it's potential, although unlikely somebody might get hurt and here's how. 
here's an idea of how we can fix that. Or maybe I don't have the solution, but I can see something's going to happen here, right? They also have to spin the wheel. So they all gather in the lunchroom once a month, and they have this event where they talk about um, all the success they have. They pick a restaurant. Everyone kind of makes suggestions about restaurants. And they do this whole chant, spin the wheel, spin the wheel. It's kind of like Price is Right with Bob Barker or Drew Carey. And they spin the wheel. And so they're a small enough company. They can afford to do you know, a 20-person lunch. They buy the lunch for that. Everybody comes in that day. Um, you know, the, the owners of the company go buy them lunch, and off they go and celebrate. And it's not work talk. It's just people hanging out, having lunch, pizza, sandwiches, soup, whatever it is. Um, you know, And then they have regular town halls. I can't support this enough. When you have regular meetings, not too much of them. But whether it's monthly, quarterly, telling folks the state of the state. You don't need to get down to the PL line, but that transparency and vulnerability of sharing information about what's going on, how we're successful, things we see on the radar, things we're struggling with, right? Those are elements that people want to know about. They feel part of the business when they're part of the solution. You don't want to scare them that, hey, we're in trouble of not making payroll, right? That's a different conversation. And then there's some different discussion points there. But if they know where the business is going and you're updating them on, hey, we're going to add five new people, one to sales, one to marketing, three to production. Uh, eventually, we want to add some more people in this department next year as this grows. That folks lets folks know the trajectory of the organization. And maybe they have friends they can bring in, which is a great thing, right? But the big cautionary piece here is there's no lip service. Say it, do it. If you're going to bring something to the table, take action on it. I'm going to click into the chat here because something else popped up. A lot of fun. Yep. So getting the trophy. Melissa likes trophies. So everybody send her your favorite trophy picture. I've got a cornhole one upstairs. It's probably a, an exception, but uh, you know that's okay. So next example. If you're in the marketing realm, or if you receive a lot of marketing emails, you've probably heard of HubSpot. They put this thing out called the culture code. It started as an internal document to help them under, you know, map out what they should be doing on the culture side. Now they use it as a recruiting tool. They let anybody, you can go Google this, you know, HubSpot's culture code. You'll find some different examples of it, different iterations, I'm sure. But it gives full transparency on what it is to be part of their culture, things they expect, things that they do, um, how employees and managers can do different things, messaging on careers. You know, this is big for us. Whatever your story is within your organization, whether you're in human services, you're in food, hospitality, manufacturing, telling more of your story and what your culture is about, what you embrace, giving examples of that. Hey, you know, we had an employee. I'll give you another example from another local company. Janelle Group is a software development company here in our area. And one of the things that they do is they celebrate their employees. They had one employee who uh, moved across the country to be here and had to sell a bunch of stuff to make the trip, um, sold a beloved guitar that he had. And he was a huge musician because um, he was actually, this guy was overseas. Um, sold his guitar and came to the U.S., built a nice little career here with this company. For an anniversary, they wanted to celebrate and show, demonstrate to him how much he mattered. So they tracked down where this guitar was. It was certain make, certain model, certain notch in the neck, and this and that and the other. They found it. They bought it from this guy, shipped it across the ocean, and handed it to him as his anniversary present. And the dude was in tears. You know, it was such a sentimental piece. Those little things, paying attention to what people's stories are and connecting with them, that's how people connect to organizations because that's how you demonstrate the caregiver mentality. An employer has the opportunity or a manager has an opportunity to provide to their employees, and that's asking questions. All right, so one place we can all start, if you are in larger organizations, you've probably heard of ERGs, employee resource groups. They help connect people with your company values and your ERGs, if you have them, they're small subsets groups of within your organization. They should all always connect to your values, right? They have to be something that's tied to your organization, but there's a bunch of different uh, benefits to them. They offer a safe space for different people to communicate and have discussion and have chatter. Doesn't mean that you're all going to agree on the things, um, but they offer opportunities for folks to have discussion, to understand better, to learn from one another and work together. They also give you some opportunity for mentorship that may come out of this. But there's tech diversity groups, there's women leadership groups, there's veteran support groups, mental health advocacy, um, the young professional network kind of piece. So if you have 
kind of generational groups within your organization. You have opportunities to form little subgroups so that people can feel, feel more connected both within their group, but how it ties to the organization's values. Uh, and there's also cultural and ethnic based groups, all sorts of examples you can find. Um, and if you need, you can ping me and I'll give you some other resources on that stuff too. So where are you now and how do you know, right? We talked about surveys. It's a great place to go. An engagement survey, five, 10 questions. I feel like the work I do is valued. I know where my path is. Um, and it's sort of yes or no, or rate one to five type of scales. You can create some of these using SurveyMonkey. I can have some tools if you want to ping me afterwards. I'd be happy to share them with you in terms of just some basic engagement type of questions to figure out where people are, right? Because that's in order for you to get where you're going, you need to know where you're starting, right? And if you're not asking questions, either face-to-face -face or in a survey format or in a group setting, you're playing guessing games. As we said, you're, you're making assumptions and that's just no good for anybody. So you got to build a plan. You do want to have some support from, from leadership, whether that's the next rung up, getting them to support those actions. Again, I point to this a little bit from the, some of you may be on the employee side of things. Uh, some of you are on that leadership and can impact things a little bit differently, but get some support. Say, hey, I'm interested in doing this. I'd like to do this. I'd like to have your support. What does that look like? You know, How involved do you need them to be? I need you to back me up. So if people aren't participating, I need you to say, hey, this is important, gang. Help me out, help your people out in sharing this information. You know, you don't want to make it too personal, meaning I feel like my boss is a big fat jerk. I don't know that I'd put that in a survey, but, uh, you know, if you have some, you know, realistic questions in there about how they fit in with your company values, how they fit in with the mission, they understand their place in it and feel valued, um, whether they'd entertain leaving for this and that and the other. I can tell you, I, I still see survey data, 40 to 50% of people, they're still entertaining leaving. They'll take a phone call, that LinkedIn piece that I showed you, some half the workforce is still entertaining things. And it's situational and it's, you know, averaged across all companies, but it's still out there. Have some timelines for these conversations and these meetings to progress forward. You know, anything that you're going to do has to be time bound. You know, if you talk about smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, uh, realistic and time bound, uh, you have to put that on the calendar and make sure it fits and it's prioritized. Because if you have people who are just showing up to show up, that doesn't do you any good. But if you're not putting the time on the calendar, they're not going to know, right? And it's going to get pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. Oh, well, we don't have time this fourth quarter because numbers are really important to us and we got to produce this and that. And, you know, no one's going to pay any attention to us. Make sure you put your dates and times and folks know it's a priority and do it well. Like if you're going to spend the time to do it, do it. Don't, don't half-ass it. So here's some engagement activities. Employee of the month, we talked about that. That's an easy one. Easy lift, right? Not peer-to-peer not, -peer nominations, um, managers nominating. You know, you can have diff different departments nominating different folks or voting on whatever the criteria are, but make sure everyone has equal access to it, right? That's that inclusivity piece of it. Make sure every department has an opportunity to contribute in some manner or scope. Peer recognitions, shout outs are huge. We do it in my organization uh, at Alant. If somebody sees their colleague doing something fantastic at our staff meetings on Fridays, they give a shout out. Hey, I saw so-and-so did this. They were just, you know, they're still new to us, but they did a bang up job, right? They really impressed the customer. They said the right things. They let them know boundaries. Hey, we can do this. We can't do that. Um, and here's why. And they did it with confidence. They'll give shout outs, right? No one feels better uh, than the person receiving that shout out. I promise you, it, it has a huge impact. And when you support giving shout outs, uh, people, they get really excited. They, they feel comfortable sharing about other people's successes. Team building, right? Uh, it's hard to do in the virtual world. Those of you that are road warriors, it's really hard to do team building virtually. It can be done. It takes effort, but you need that either online or in person, whether it's uh, once a week, coffee chat before the, at the start of the day and set of just your morning huddle about, hey, you're going here, you're going there, I'm going to Iowa City, you're going to Denver, uh, we're going to tackle these customers, right? This team building component, is finding some fabric about what they're interested. Sometimes it's games, sometimes it's pets. I'm not a cat person. My colleagues all love cats and they roast me for it, but uh, I'm allergic to them, so I stay far away from them. Um, but team building is a huge piece. And you can do that through potlucks, right? What's better than food? If you have an in-office environment or you're hybrid, 
pick a day a month or put day a quarter where everybody brings in their favorite meal and you know they can celebrate hey I love dishes with curry in them, or I need something that has vegan options and so on and so forth. It allows people to share some personality about what interests them, and it helps connect to that caregiving mentality. I mentioned that a couple of times uh, within an organization. Book clubs, some want to do it more business oriented. You want to have leadership conversations. You want to have, um, so maybe some emerging leaders want to develop some skills, form a leadership book club, right? They're not hard to get. You can get them online and get them from the library. You can get them through the audio apps, Audible, Heck, if you need to buy a few copies, buy a few copies, right? I work for a publisher. I'm going to sell you on buying new because it helps, you know, generate uh, some dollars for the hard-earned work that the authors put into it. But you know as well as I do, you can find some of these things on eBay and so on and so forth. Um, but you can discuss how we model this in our company uh, or we could. Maybe there's some examples that you could come up with from those groups. What else have you seen? Anybody else has, have some engagement activities that they've been trying? Drop it in the chat. This is where I say Bueller. <laughs> I have to watch that again. All right, here we go. So had a boss who put a little gold stars in employees' computer screens if they'd done something particularly great. That's great. It's just a little token and everybody knows what it is. Who doesn't want a sticker, right? I want to know what it's for. So here's a good note, right? So Melissa brings this out. Um, some people like public recognition. Some people don't. Know who those folks are. And you can ask them when you onboard them, or maybe you know, but ask them, hey, do you mind, as a group, does anybody mind public recognition? If you do something great, I want to give you a, you know, kudos, a little trophy certificate, whatever it is. I just don't want to embarrass you. We want to celebrate. And if you do, there are some times where I've had to say, hey, look, you did something really great here. I'm sharing with everyone, right? I, we also have colleagues who kind of, they're their own selves, and they just, they're like, hey, I'd rather not take credit for this. I just want to be part of the team. Great. We had somebody who did something great. They didn't want to be recognized, but I just want to recognize them silently and, and let you know that we have some great team players here. So don't devalue the impact that those things can have. There's, there's a number of different engagement activities that have, uh, you know, asking questions. What are my teammates passionate about? I wrote a short list down here that you don't see on the screen. Um, you know, getting your health and wellness in order. Maybe there's a walking club. Maybe there's folks that like to get into fitness and they like talking about it. Weekly wins, we do this at my office. Anybody has a win, they want to share work, personal, doesn't matter, you share it, right? And everybody celebrates and applauds for you and they, let, they start to realize what's going on in your life. You know, hey, my mom had hip surgery and she's finally free from PT. Great, off and running you go. So let me drop another question here. One of the difficulties in creating good culture where I work is that our departments are very siloed. How can I foster stronger connections when we're so separate? Well, you start with the one department, right? You, you have to impact good culture there. That's going to breed to other areas. You start to invite some of the other folks from uh, cross-connected or other stakeholders. So generally speaking, if you have siloed departments, sales, marketing, finance, HR, those HR people, they're the worst, aren't they? Um, you start to invite one or two of them. Say, hey, let's cross-pollinate. I'll send a couple of people to my department for your monthly meeting. You send a couple to our department just so they can sit in and see what's going on. You start to foster, whether that's over a lunch or a coffee, you could say, hey, uh, one of the things I've seen companies do is they will randomly pair people. It's up to them to do the networking conversation. We'll randomly pair them for 30 minute conversation, lunch, coffee, drinks, you choose. You want to go hit golf balls with somebody for half an hour, go do that. I don't care. Here's your paired person for the month. Go have a conversation. And you can do that with, a, you know, duos, trios, quads, um, call them DTQs, um, duos, trios, and, and quads, where you can kind of sit down and have some conversations and share what's going on. Great. Share some of the struggles that you're having, but you have to start building somewhere. So start with your own department and then build it out. Invite some people in so they can see some of the great things that you're doing and why people, and, and get some quotes from your people. Hey, I really like this. This is going well because X, Y, Z, right? So hopefully that helps. Um, other activities, uh, maybe you bring in a motivational speaker, uh, find ways to better onboard new people. So talk to some of the newer people in your organization. How was it like, you know, talk to folks that onboarded a year ago. I was talking with somebody about an example where somebody had an awful experience with their onboarding. They're still with the organization because they believe it, but they described this and that and the other about what went wrong and how they were left off, off in an island and no one told them what to do. They still stayed. I'm like, that's a perfect person to bring into this circle. 
right? Bring them into that group of ambassadors that say, hey, I want to fix this. I want to make sure everybody else does, has a better experience than I did. So that way we can maintain, I'm the exception sort of thing. Um, and there's a lot of volunteering, whether you're going to go help Habitat for Humanity. Different projects can help connect people in ways that you just can't foresee. Got to click back into my screen here. All right, so it starts with you. You got you to speak up. You got to talk to your manager, talk to your leaders, gather some information, whether you're a frontline manager, manager team lead, supervisor, non-supervisory leaders. You don't have to have a title to be a leader, right? I gave you some starter ideas to... Uh, but ask some questions about what employees have seen, especially the new ones. What went well in the last organization? What didn't go well in the last organization or past organizations? And what would you like to see? You know, and, and remember, food brings all people together. Um, and one element I like to lean in, if you're going to give managers extra things to do in their already busy lifestyle uh, schedule, make sure you're pulling something off. So... Here are some of those engagement pieces. And again, if you ping me afterwards, my contact information is at the end. I can get you, I have some sample surveys that you could use. Do you know, you know, things that you want to find out? Do your employees know what's expected of them? Don't assume. And maybe a survey will give you a better, clearer answer of anonymous information. 40% of my workforce knows what's expected of them. All right, you have some information gaps, right? Do you know the, Do they know the impact on the organization? Do your managers meet with them one-on-one -on -one regularly? And I don't mean to get scolded for not getting this in on time. I mean, checking in, how's things going? How are you feeling about your workload? How are you feeling about home? Are you feeling stressed? Is there anything that we can change or help you or give you different resources or reorganize? Help them with what's going on. Sometimes they need to vent. Some people call it whining. That's not really what it is. They just need to air it out. Other people have a real issue that needs res resolution and they need some help. And having those one-on-ones can help open that conversation so they're more comfortable saying, hey, this didn't go right. I tried this. It didn't work. I need to try something else. I need help. And some of that's failure too. Employees are going to fail things. Let them know it's okay to admit failure. You don't want them failing all the time, but if they don't learn from their mistakes, they're going to hide those failures and get slapped on the wrist for it. We're almost at time. So I'm going to get through these last couple of slides. There's some other things here. Um, you know, they're going to give you ideas on how to make your culture better. You know, think about how you do things now versus how you could. You know, and what are you? What have you done so far? And where your people go for help? And if they're comfortable having conversations, great. If they're not having comfortable conversations, then you have some trust issues to resolve, and you need to put that out there. Um, there's transparency everywhere. Uh, read Brene Brown about vulnerability. If if you can put it out there that hey, I'm struggling with engaging my workforce. I need your help. I haven't done a great job at this in the past. They're going to come back to you. So your execution have a couple of priorities. Put it on the calendar, start working on it over the next six to 12 months. Don't let up on it. You know, put your things on the calendar to make it happen. Otherwise, it's going to fall through, flat in your face. Schedule time for the engagement. Um, include some ambassadors, people that sing praises, that buy, that, that as they say, drink the company Kool-Aid. Have them help you out. They're in touch with the folks that aren't, right? The folks that aren't engaged. And they can say, hey, I think we need to do a couple of other things to include Susie and Joe and Bob. Um, and then share the wealth. If you have new ideas from organizations, from friends' organizations, it's like the game of life. Uh, you have to share the wealth cards, share the ideas. Um, and we talked a little bit about this. It's just the success looks like you're setting up cadence with your leaders. You may, as a leader in your organization, have to help them out if they're not comfortable with this. There are certainly leaders who've become managers by default. They need some training and skill development on this area too. They're not comfortable with the touchy feely stuff all the time. Giving them some role modeling, um, some practice, uh, role playing is what I meant to say. Giving them some of that, that space to try something out, having somebody sit with them and help them with those conversations is gonna make them a little bit better at that. And that's what you're after, is to make some impact. Give them some summary of engagement activities since the last meeting, have them talk about, hey, we tried this. This worked really well. People liked it. Let's chase this. Or, hey, we like this. Let's try something similar and add, continue adding to this. Or this failed. Let's celebrate. I, I love improv. They call it a circus bow. Celebrate failure. I almost knocked my water down. That was dangerous. Um, but make sure you're doing some postmortem on that stuff, meaning how did it go? Did it work? People are interested. You know, get some evaluation criteria to decide whether you're not you're going to move this forward. Um, reward and recognition. We talked about that. There's an integrity. You can you can make stuff up. Somebody has the best chili. 
All right, you get the Chili Award. We did this last year. We just made up on a whim somebody who's good at this and that and the other. They did something fantastic. There wasn't any monetary piece of it. We just wanted to celebrate in kind of a tongue-in-cheek manner. You know, we have one uh, person on our team. She says literally all the time. So she got the literally award. And it was fun because everybody got something. Um, it wasn't, it was just a little bit of recognition about who we are and celebrating our individuality, but also that team capacity. Um, there's other companies they'll send, they'll put postcards through their store or their office. If they have customers coming in, uh, clients, uh, patients, et cetera. You can nominate somebody, hey, so-and-so did a great job and it gets sent in to whatever centralized inbox system that they have. And it gives you that little recognition point of, hey, somebody appreciated me. Um, so be vulnerable, keep taking risks, um, set a roadmap, uh, put your plan into place. I'm going to skip over these last couple because we sort of talked about some of these things. Um, and now we're going to jump onto the QA piece. But at, what I want you to throw into your to-do at this point, one thing you got today, one thing you're going to either start or stop doing, and when you're going to do it. I'm big on this. I use it in just about every conversation, presentation, workshop, et cetera, that I talk to. Because um, if you're going to attend something, walk away with something. Put something into your deck. Again, to start or stop doing something that you figured out, hey, I should stop listening to Tom, or I need to do more workshops, or I need some more examples, I need to do some reading. Any of those, anything that you can inspired from this, jot it down. And if you want to share, by all means, throw it out there. I'm happy to have that um, nugget. So here's my contact information, uh, my email address, phone number. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm all over the place on the internet. Um, so by all means, Melissa, you got anything else we want to dive into here? Well, I think you covered it all. That hour zipped by. I, I've got a bunch of great takeaways that I was jotting down. So I, uh, I took your advice even before you gave it. So um, thank you so much. As I said, I, I'm this was great. I'm uh, confident that everyone else has got their, their takeaways too. Um, I encourage you all to put that into place. Um, thank you again, Tom. Thanks for sharing your information. I will follow up with an email to everyone and I'll include Tom's information there as well in case you want to uh, reach out. So you can look for that in the next couple of days. So have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks everybody. Oh, there's a couple of chats. Wait. Oh, all right. We'll wait. Oh, just a couple of thank yous. Oh, appreciate it. Thanks, Olivia. <laughs> all Thanks. right. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Glad you got something out of it. I appreciate that. All right. Next time I'll bring my ukulele. That that's sitting over my shoulder there. There's one. There. <laughs> I will invite you back then because I want to hear that. <laughs> All right. Have a great day.